Hi, everybody. This is Evangelist Clayton Jennings here. I'm glad that you're tuning in right now, and I believe that God's brought you to this point for a reason, out of His grace and your life. Stay with me. You don't want to turn the channel or do anything else right now because I believe God has a special message for somebody out there right now, and that special person could be you. I love the fact that Jesus loves us. And I love the fact that he's willing to meet us wherever we're at and have a conversation with us, even when we're lost, even when we're alone, even when we're uh, dealing with the afflictions of this world. Jesus was no different 2,000 years ago than he is right here, right now. And I believe the conversation that Jesus had with this man in the book of Luke is a conversation that he might be having with one of you right now. Here's what happens. Now, you've probably heard this story before. It's the story of the Good Samaritan. But I promise you, you've never heard it like this. I believe this is what the, what the story of the Good Samaritan truly means and why God had Jesus tell in the first place. It's an evangelistic story. And how we know that is this. Everything in Scripture is in context. So we have to look at the context of the Scripture. Who was Jesus talking to in the first place? Jesus is talking to a lost man. And we know that everything that Jesus did was out of a heart of truth and grace and mercy and love, right? So if Jesus is talking to a lost man and he tells him a story about the kingdom of God and how to have eternal life, we have to believe that it's an evangelistic tool. Now the church has taken this and they've turned it into something to tell you how to love your neighbor, how to do this and that. And I believe you can take it and you can do that as well. But at its core content, Jesus is using this to speak to lost people. And maybe that's you out there somewhere today. And you don't have to be lost anymore. Over the next few minutes, I'm going to tell you what Jesus wants from you and what Jesus expects from you and why you can't achieve it, but he can. Luke chapter 10, verse 25 says this. It says, a lawyer stood up and put Jesus to the test. I'm not a smart guy, but I do know this. It's a dumb move to put Jesus to the test. That's something that you just don't do. And when he puts Jesus to the test, he says this, Teacher, what shall I do to obtain eternal life? I love the fact that in that day and age, everybody's talking about eternal life. We live in American society today where that's the last thing that we think about. We're too busy keeping up with the Kardashians. We're too busy following political agendas. We're too busy trying to enjoy the comforts of this world. The last thing that we ever think about and contemplate in this society today is where we're going to go when we leave this world. We never think about eternal things. That's all they thought about. And good on them for at least contemplating where they would go after they leave this world. Here's what happens. What do I have to do to obtain eternal life? Now, that's an emphasis on himself, isn't it? Because he doesn't say, Jesus, you tell me, how can you give me eternal life? Which leads us to believe he doesn't believe Christ is the Messiah in the first place. No, he puts it on himself and he says, what do I have to do? It's a prideful thing. And a lot of people in America today think the same thing. How many church services do I have to attend? How many things do I have to post online about how good of a Christian I am? How can I build myself to, up to be more spiritual than the next guy? What do I have to do? And you're putting the weight of your own salvation on your own shoulders, and that's the worst thing that you could ever do. Here's what happens. What do I have to do to obtain eternal life? And Jesus says this. He says, what is written in the law? How does it read to you? And the man answers and says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. He goes right to good works. It's religion. Jesus wants a relationship. This man is preaching religion. So he says, okay, I think I know what the law says about how to obtain eternal life. It's a vertical and horizontal thing. And here's how so. It's vertical because it's you loving God with all your heart, your mind, and your soul. And it's a horizontal thing because you have to love people the same way. Love them as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. And we've heard that all the time. But do we really know what it means? I can't wait to tell you. So it's a vertical and horizontal thing. That's how you obtain eternal life. And I tell you right now, you want to go to heaven? Live perfectly. Love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love people just the same. And never fail, never mess up, never sin once. And if you do that, maybe, just maybe, you'll be good enough to enter into the kingdom of God. And maybe that's what you've been told before. Maybe it's all on your shoulders. Jesus tells this man that. And the man understands that it's on him to do good works. Jesus wants to peel away those layers and reveal to him that he could never be as good as God intended people to be and the standard perfection to enter into the kingdom of God. You can't do it. Why did God intend us to be that way? Because he loved us. Why can't we? Because Adam and Eve failed and we have a sin nature because of them and what they did in the Garden of Eden. The Bible says through one man sin entered the world. It's been here ever since. So the law is just put in place to show us you can't be good enough. But somebody can, and that somebody is Jesus. Here's what happens. Jesus says to him, you have answered correctly, do this and you will live. Oh, wow, that's a hard thing. Now imagine if I told you right now, hey, that's it, be perfect. Love people, love God, do it perfectly, and then you might have a shot. 
okay, goodbye, everybody. You can turn the channel. You would leave in desperation, and you would say, I can't, right? I can't do that. I can't be perfect. I know I've already slipped up and messed up before. And that's exactly right. And that's what Jesus wants him to say. I can't. This is an I can't text. Because Jesus is looking for the man to say, wait a minute, Jesus, I can't do those things. Help me. And then Jesus would say, good. Now that you understand that you can't, understand that I can. Now take my hand and let's do this thing together. But out of the man's pride and arrogance, this is what he says. He says this, wishing to justify himself, which is an awful proposition. He says, who is my neighbor? It's a cynical thing. Who, who is worthy of my love? Who do I have to love to enter into the kingdom of God? Now notice this. He said that the law reads that you have to love God perfectly and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said, that's right, do those things. But then the man says, well, who's my neighbor? So he's completely skipped over the God thing, which leads us to believe this. He already believes that he loves God with all his heart, mind, and soul, and that he's kept that relationship perfect for his entire life, which is a complete and utter lie. There's no way. He's a lost man. So he jumps to the one thing. He thinks, okay, well, who's my neighbor? You tell me, Jesus, because I already got the other part figured out with God, but I'm going to be able to do this one too. You tell me. That's when the story of the Good Samaritan comes into play. you got to set the tone for all that dialogue, and then Jesus launches into this story, and it's beautiful. Jesus tells the story, and he says this, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among robbers, and they stripped him and beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. I've been to that location. When it says he went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, it literally means he went down. Thousands of feet of sea level down over a short span of time. It's a steep incline. We actually find out that a couple centuries after Jesus lived and died and rose again, that people still hung out there and robbed individuals, highway robbers, evil people. Jesus sets up the story then because everybody knew where that area was. So here you have a Jewish man going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he gets jumped. And they don't just beat him. No, the translation of beat him here literally means to pumble. They beat him over and over and over again. Critical condition. This man needs to be taken to ICU. He's at the last uh, point of death. He's right there. It says this in verse 31. And by chance, a priest was going down on that road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Verse 31 gets our hopes up, doesn't it? Because it says, okay, a priest is there. Surely he's going to help him. Let me tell you this. Do not always rely on religious people. Because religious people can be some of the worst people. Because it's not about being a religious person. It's about being a child of God. And there's a lot of people that claim Christ but don't live like him. Don't put your faith in religious people. Put your faith in Christ followers, but Christ more specifically. Here's a priest. He comes by. Now, if this man is who we think he is, and Jesus says he's a priest, then he has to know Old Testament law, and he has to know that it's his moral obligation and duty and law by God to help this man. You see, we find out in portions of Deuteronomy and the Old Testament law that even if you see a man's cattle in need, you have to help the cattle. So even more so if the man's in need. So here comes the priest. He knows what he has to do. And he says he goes by the other side. That literally means he went the opposite way. He didn't just pass by and say, hey, how you doing? He went the opposite way. But we see more, we see more hope in verse 32. It says this, likewise a Levite also, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. Now that gets us excited too, doesn't it? Because Levite people are religious people, and they know the law too. Now in the bureaucracy of the religious esteem, here you have the priests, and then eh, one step lower you have the Levites. But they still know the law, right? They should still be able to help. So come on, we're rooting for him to do something, but instead he goes by on the opposite way as well. Now we see in verse 33 a shocking thing, and Jesus is good at telling shocking portions to his stories, and it says, but a Samaritan who was on a journey came upon him. Now no way in the world a Samaritan is going to help. Samaritan people hated Jewish people, and Jewish people hated Samaritan people. It'd be as if today, if you're watching this and, and you uh, were to be uh, headed down the road and you see someone who's an ISIS member, and they're beat up, and they're hurt, and they're in need, and you see them, are you going to help them? I mean, they're our enemy, right? They hate us. They want to kill you if you're an American. And we have no love for them. At least we're trained not to have love for them. But Jesus says, pray for your enemies. Well, here we have this man. And we have a Samaritan man. Jewish Samaritan. No way he's going to help him. If the priest passed by and the Levite passed by, then what hope is there for the Samaritan man to help his enemy? 
Apparently, there's all the hope in the world when Jesus tells this story because it says this. He came upon him, and when he saw him, he felt compassion. And I believe the same thing happens when Jesus sees you because it starts with a visual. It says he saw him, and then he felt for him. And wherever you're at, wherever you're watching this right now, don't you understand that Jesus sees you? And when he sees you, he feels compassion for you. He loves you and your brokenness, and there might be a failed marriage, there might be relationships or addictions that, that have gone awry, but God sees you. And when he sees you, his heart feels compassion toward you. Same way this Samaritan man saw the Jew. This is what happens. It didn't end with a feeling. It says he came to him and he bandaged up his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them, and he put him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. It would be very odd if this man carried around a first aid kit, right? I mean, that'd be a, a super strange thing. So if he bandaged him, what, how did he come up with bandages? He literally ripped his own clothing to help this man. He took the shirt off of his own back. And it doesn't say he dabbled some of the oil and wine to help. What is the oil there for? The oil there is to help loosen up the wounds. The, the wine's there as a way of a sanitizing element. It says he poured it out. It's a lavish type of love. And we want to pat our backs for putting a dollar in the homeless, man cup, homeless man's cup down the street. No, this is what love looks like. It looks like going the extra mile and then another mile and then another mile. It looks like a lavish love, a sacrificial love. It looks a lot like the love that Jesus has for you. He takes him to an inn after carrying him on his own beast. It says on the next day, which is shocking, the next day, what? It means he stayed with him all night long because he loved him that much. On the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him and whatever more you spend, when I, re when I return, I will repay you. So it looks like this. Not only am I going to leave you here, but I'm going to pay your stay. And I'm going to tell the innkeeper whatever he needs, whatever he wants, whatever's going to help him get better, you pay for it. I'm going to come back and I'm going to refund that. Why? He's a stranger. I don't know. I feel compassion for him and I love him. Here's what happens next. Jesus looks at this man who is standing here asking about eternal life in the midst of a crowd. And Jesus says, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? Easy question, right? And he steps right up to it. And he hangs the trap for his own sin. And this is what he says. He says, the one who showed mercy toward him. And Jesus said, go and do the same. Yep, you pointed it out, which means you understand it. Now that you understand it and you've said as much, you do the same thing, and you'll obtain eternal life. you got to be kidding me. Again, Jesus is just looking for him to say, I can't. It's an I can't text, but here I am in Luke chapter 10, and I'll keep turning to 11 and 12 and 13 and 14 and 15. I'll jump to John, and I'll jump to Philippians, and I'll jump all the way back, back to Revelation, and what will happen? We never hear from this man again, and I promise you, as I preach crusades around this world, there are thousands of people who come to them, who hear the news and walk away, and we never hear from them again. And I don't want that to be you wherever you're at. You have to understand in context what this story means and how it applies to you. What Jesus is saying is this, you can't be good enough. You can't love your neighbor as yourself. Because when Jesus sets the script as to what loving your neighbor as yourself looks like, we just can't add up to that. You might say... Look, uh, I've never taken care of somebody like this before. And Jesus wants me to love everybody like that, to go out of my way every day with every person I meet. There's no way. Well, I promise you that you've loved somebody like that Samaritan man loved that Jew. You have. Wherever you're at, you, you have. You see, when that person was tired, you made sure they got rest. When they were uh, beat up and hurt, you made sure they got bandaged. You made sure that all their needs were met. You were willing to even go into debt to make sure they were comfortable. Who is that person? It's you, because you love yourself. We're all trained to love ourselves. That's what that means, love your neighbor as yourself. Well, you love yourself, but love everybody the same way that you love you. Can you do it? I know I can't, and I know I've failed a thousand times, because I can't be good enough, but thank God I don't have to be. Jesus was for me, and it's not even, in, it's not even enough that you love your neighbor that way. We've skipped over completely loving God that way. You love God that much? You ever sin one time? If you have, then you've never loved God with all your heart, mind, and soul because you, you're flawed from the jump. I'm the same way. I've messed that relationship up vertically, and I've messed that relationship up horizontally with people throughout my entire life. 
this man right here could never enter into the kingdom of God unless he submitted himself to the one who stood before him in the first place. Jesus is asking this man to say, I can't. That's all Jesus wants from you to say is, I can't. And in a society and a culture that wants to tell you all the time, you can, you can, you can, you can, Jesus stands here and says, you can't, you can't, you can't, I can. So do you want it? Come to me. And then through my work on the cross and my resurrection, you can enter into the kingdom of God. You'll never be good enough to enter into the kingdom of God on your own. Not enough good deeds, not enough good works, not enough church attendance, not enough tuning in and watching somebody like me will ever get you into heaven. The only way is to come to Jesus Christ and say, I understand that I can't, but I believe that you can, and now I'm asking you to save me. You see, when you were just like that man, the Jewish man, beat up, pummeled, at the last portion of your life, at the end of your rope, Jesus saw you and said, I'm willing to take his lashings, I'm willing to take his beatings, I'm willing to go to the cross for him, I'm willing to go to the cross for you. When Jesus hung on the cross for the sins of the world, he thought about you by name. And he knows what you did last night, what you did today, and he knows what you're going to do tomorrow, and he still loves you. He still says, I'm willing to set you free and save you because your good works and loving people and loving God is just not enough. But my crucifixion and resurrection is everything. So understand that you can't, and then I'm going to tell you I can. And then take my hand, and let's do it together. Because Jesus wants you. He wants your heart. He wants to set you free and save you. And maybe you're at the end of your rope and you say, I understand, I can't. I've been trying too long, too hard. I can't overcome these struggles. I can't overcome this, this debt, this sin, this addiction. I don't know what to do. Come to Jesus. Leave your burdens at the cross and let him give you peace. And you might be a believer out there saying, I, I can't fight this anymore. I can't fight that anymore. I'm tired and I feel alone. Come back to your first love because the door is always wide open. And there's always freedom at the cross. Jesus stands right there with a the bucket and says, just put your failures here, put your pain here, put your sorrow here, put everything here, and walk with me, and I'll set you free. How do you do that? The Bible says confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. If it's your desire to give your life to Jesus, and I hope that it is right now, if you want to say, I can't, but I believe you can, you pray after me and you give your heart to the Lord right now, and he's listening. And you say, dear Lord, I believe I'm a sinner, but I believe you died for me. And I'm asking you to save me. I repent of my sins. I trust in you. I'm following you. I give you my life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you made that decision, the best thing you could ever do now is this. Get plugged into a local church, get baptized, and follow Jesus with everything that you have. And in any moment in your life and in your journey, when you understand and feel again like you can't understand that with Christ, you can do anything, overcome all things, as long as he's central in your life. Come to Jesus. Go to Jesus. He's always there. And he's a help along the way of this journey that can be so hard as we go through life. He loves you. And I believe that if you gave your life to him, that now for the first time, you will experience freedom and a home in heaven when you leave this world. We can't, but Jesus can. Let's put our faith and trust in him. God bless you all.